We just spoke about randomness and how we can use randomness to create uh, independent random variables and how with a small amount of um, mutually independent random variables we can sort of amplify to get a larger number of pairwise independent random variables. Here we want to take some of these same ideas about randomness but we want to use them to make hash functions that have desirable properties. Hash functions where we can make statements about, for example, how often a hash function will create a collision between two different elements. So let's look at the idea of a family of hash functions. So let's say that the way we're going to operate is we're going to define a, a family of hash functions. And for any given iteration of our uh, algorithm, for any given particular run of our algorithm, we're going to choose some hash functions from that family and we're always going to pick them uniformly at random from among the hash functions in the family. And then we're going to call the family big H. So we've got our family of hash functions big H. And the hash functions are always going to, going to be going from a universe U, drawn here, um, to a range, which is in the case of, say, a hash table or a Bloom filter, this could be the number of buckets. Right? So we're using the hash functions to go from the universe to a smaller range. Okay, And so what's the kind of property we would like a hash function to have? Well, certainly uniformity, but we can also make statements about how often two different items are going to collide. So let's make a specific statement and define what for us would be a desirable family of hash functions. So we'll say a family of hash functions big H is universal if for distinct elements, x1 and x2, so x1 and x2 not the same, two different items from the universe, and for some function small h that we drew from big H, we have this property, that the probability that h, where, where h maps x1 equals where h maps x2. In other words, that x1 and x2 go into the same bucket of the hash table or slot of the Bloom filter that that probability is at most 1 over n, right? So there's n possibilities. So what we want is we would like it to be a guarantee that over my choice of hash functions from that family, the probability that that hash function maps x1 and x2 to the same slot is at most 1 over n. So that's what we're shooting for. And in this video, we will start by talking about why is this property desirable? And we'll show one proof that uses this property. We'll talk about a kind of naive family of hash functions that achieves this property, but that isn't very practical. And then what we'll go into in the next video is an incredibly convenient and, and relatively simple family that achieves this goal. So first let's talk about if we could establish this fact about a family of hash functions, what would it let us do? What sort of role would that play in allowing us to prove things? Well, let's take a very uh, uh, commonly studied scenario and a proof that you may have even seen before, which is we're going to talk about what is the query time for a hash table, right? For a hash table using chaining. So let's say we have a hash table, we're using chaining, we've added a set S of M items to that hash table using a hash function drawn uniformly at random from a universal family. And we want to analyze uh, how much work do we have to do to query that hash table. And if you think about querying a, a hash table using chaining, right, querying means we're given a key, we then want to go do a lookup in the hash table to see does that key, has that key been added previously, and if so, what's the associated value, and we want to return the associated value if, it ex if the key exists. If the key doesn't exist, we'll return null or some other indicator that the key is not there. So of course this process, in the worst case, uh, you know, in the case that causes us to do the most work, would be we go to, we use our hash function to hash the key, it sends us to a bucket of the hash table, and that bucket has a linked list of items in it, and now we have to go scan that linked list looking for the key. So how much work is that? Can we characterize how much work that is? And what we're going to build toward is a proof that shows that 
if m is less than or equal to n, if the number of items is less than or equal to the number of buckets, then we can claim that that query is expected constant time. Okay? Okay, so let's start by defining a random variable that's going to be helpful for our analysis. So for some element that we are using to query the hash table, let's define, uh, let's call it that small x, let's define a random variable big X, which is the number of items in the bucket that the hash function points us to. So we hash x, and it sends us to a bucket. We now have, in our analysis, we've defined the random variable big X to be the number of items in that bucket. What we'd like to show is that the expected number of items, of course the number of items in that list is proportional to the amount of work we have to do, because we have to scan that list in order to see if any of those elements are uh, little x. So what we'd like to show is that the expected number of items in that bucket is upper bounded by something. So we're going to have to write something in here for the case where x is, you know, this is the x not in table case. Right? So if x is not an element of the set, and then this is the case where x is in the table. You have to consider those two cases both. Right? x is in the set. So what do we want, what are we going to be able to write in here? Let's see. What we'd like is we'd like for the hash function to spread everything out evenly. In other words, in a given uh, item, uh, in a given slot bucket of the hash table, I should have about m over n things in there, right? So the number of items in that bucket, the expected number of items in that bucket should be at worst m over n. In the case where the item is not in the set. In the case where the item is in the set, we have to think of it slightly differently because of course one of the items in that list is the item that we're querying. And we know that's in the set, so we know that's in the list. So we can't just say m over n because we know there's at least one item in that list, which is the one that we're looking for. And then as for what else might be in the list, well that should be, again, the hash function should have spread things out uniformly at random. So there we expect m minus 1 over n. In other words, for all the remaining m minus 1 items, they should each have a 1 in n chance of being in that bucket. Okay? So that's what we'd like to be able to show. So let's now just show it, and in the process of showing it, we'll use universality. So we're going to assume we have a, un again, we're saying h was chosen uniformly at random from a universal family, so we can use the property of the universal family in that proof. Okay, so let's take the first case, the not in table case first. All right, so we're concentrating on this case. Okay, and let's define kind of a helper random variable, which we'll call big X sub i. And big X sub i is a random variable that the way we define it is it equals 1 when the ith element of the set s, s is the set of things that we are adding, that we added to the hash table. So x sub i equals 1 when the ith element of the set s is in the same bucket as x, the item we're querying with. Otherwise, if it's not in the same bucket, then big X sub i equals 0. Now this is a special kind of random variable, this big X sub i. For one thing, it's a Bernoulli random variable. Right, because a Bernoulli random variable is a random variable that has outcomes uh, mapped to 1 and 0, sort of like a, toy, a coin toss. Um, but in this case, we say it's 1 when something else happens. It's 1 when some event happens. And so this is a special kind of Bernoulli random variable called an indicator, indicator random variable. All right, Just like a Bernoulli random variable, it's got 1 and 0, but uh, it's a special case because we define it that it is equal to 1 when some other event happens, right? So the, the um, outcome is tied to the probability of some event. Okay, so I've got my indicator random variables, and the question is, What's the probability that some indicator random variable, big X sub i, equals 1? In other words, what's the probability that some other item collided with 
my item little x in the case where x is not in the table? Well, we know by, uh, it's straightforward that by universality, because we picked our hash function from a universal family, that's at most 1 over n. That's how we defined it. So we know that the probability that a given indicator random variable is equal to 1 is at most 1 over n, just by the definition of the universal hash family and the fact that we chose um, h uniformly from that family. Okay, so let's write out what can we write for the expected value of big X, right, the, the how much work do we have to do, random variable, specifically for the X not in the table case. So let's write that out. Okay, so big X, the number of items in that bucket, is the sum of all the X sub I's, right? If the X sub I's are whether or not some item collided with little x, and I want to know the total number of items in that bucket, I just simply add up all the colliders. All right, so the expected value of big X is expected value of the sum from i equals 1 to m of all the indicators. Okay, so I've got run one random variable that I've written as a sum of constituent smaller random variables I can now use linearity of expectation to move the expectation inside the sum. So I can write this as sum i equals 1 to m of the expected value of x sub i. And now we have to pause to think about what's the expected value of the x sub i. Well, it's a Bernoulli random variable, right? It's a special, we said it's a special kind of Bernoulli random variable called an indicator. And the expected value of a Bernoulli p random variable is just p. And this particular indicator random variable is 1 with probability equal to um, the probability that there was a collision. All right. So by the universal property, we know that what's inside here, this expected value of x sub i, we know that that is at most 1 over n, right? Because that, again, it's just equal to the probability of collision that some other item, that some item that was in the set collides with x, which was not in the set, which we said is at most 1 over n because we were, we we're using a universal hash function. So we use linearity in the first step, and in the second step, we simply can say it's at most m over n m coming from the fact that we have this sum, right, and then times 1 over n, because that's what universality tells us. It tells us that each of those expected value of x sub i's is at most 1 over n, right, and I'm adding up m of them, so the whole thing is at most m over n. Okay? And that's exactly what we wanted to show for that first case, the case where x is not in the table. Now for the, for the case where x is in the table, this is what we said we wanted to show. It was different from the first case because we need to consider that since x is in the table, that one of the items in the chain hanging off of the bucket for x will be x, and then the rest of them will be colliders. Okay, so same setup as before, we're going to define the indicator random variables big X sub i equal to 1 when the ith element of the set x is in the same bucket as x equal to 0 otherwise. The wrinkle here, the thing that's a little bit different here, is that one of the items in the set is x itself. So let's just say that that one is big X sub 1. So without loss of generality, let's just say that the index i equals 1 corresponds to the item in the set that is x. Okay, so in that case we can still write down, just as we did before, that by universality the probability that one of these indicator random variables is equal to 1 is at most 1 over n for, and this is important, for i greater than 1. Right? For i equal to 1 the probability is 1 because i equal to 1 corresponds to the element that is x. Okay, so now let's write down the expectation again. Similar story. So again, 
that's just the expected value of the sum of the in, uh, oops of the indicator random variables x sub i by linearity we can push the expectation inside but here's what I'm going to do actually I'm going to push the expectation inside and I'm going to pull out i equals 1 so I'm going to pull i equals 1 out because the probability of a uh, of of that item mapping to the same bucket as x is 1 because it is x so I'm going to pull out a 1 plus and then I'm going to change the index of my sigma so it's going from 2 up to m instead of from 1 up to m all right and then of course what goes inside is the expected value of the x sub i so that was a combination of using linearity and then bringing one of the expectations out, the one that's equal to one. The rest of the expectations, as usual, are, right, so these individual expectations for all the other indicators from two up to m are, each of them is at most one over m, right? So I'm gonna end up getting equals one plus m minus one over n. Uh, and this is a less than or equal to, right? Because that's what universality is telling us is that it's at most one over n. Okay? So I get this. And those are the, that's now the second of the two cases. So I was able to show exactly what I wanted to show, which is to say the expected number of items in the bucket that little x gets assigned to by the hash function is at most m over n in the case where x is not an element of the set and then this one plus m minus one over n in the case where x is an element of the set and if you say that the number of items being added to the hash table is at most the number of buckets in the hash table then you can further think about these two cases by saying okay well then m over n in other words if m equals n then m over n is one so then we're saying that the expected length of the list is one in that case. And if m equals n, then this second one, you know, for a sufficiently large m and n, this is pretty close to one, right? It's, obviously, it's a little bit less than one. So it's about two for the in table case if m is equal to n. So is it reasonable to assume that m is equal to n? Well, in reality, when we add things to hash tables, we try to keep the hash table at a certain load factor. Right, we don't want to have many more items than there are uh, uh, buckets in the hash table. So it's typical if we have exceeded that load factor to just, for example, double the size of the hash table, rehash whatever's in the hash table, and move on. And you can do amortized analysis to, to prove to yourself that that's not so bad, having to double the size of the hash table as you're adding items. So it's a reasonable assumption to say that we can keep m less than n. We can keep n as an upper bound on m. And therefore, it's reasonable to think of the query time of a hash table as being essentially constant, constant time, big O of one constant time. And that's without making assumptions about the input, because again, the magic of the hash functions is as long as the hash functions have the properties we need, then we can use those properties to prove what we need. We don't need to transfer those, uh, those assumptions, distributional assumptions or whatever else onto the input. So this is not a statement about the average case. This is saying with universal hash functions, um, it is the case that we get constant, and assuming that m is less than or equal to n, it is the case that we get constant query time. Okay, so universal hashing gives us very important properties, and this is just one example where we can use it in a proof. We'll use it in more proofs in other videos. So how do we get that? What kind of, uh, we, we know we want to use randomness, but how are we going to use it, right? We definitely need some sort of randomness in how we choose the hash function because we're going to choose it, quote unquote, uniformly at random from this family, this universal family. So the next question is what on earth could this family be? So let me give one proposal for what the family could be and we'll, and we'll think about it a little bit. So the proposal is this. Right, here's the property we want. What kind of family has this property? Well, here's a first attempt. We could say that the family, big H, is just the set of all possible functions from the universe to 
the desired range of the hash function. In other words, from 0 up to size of u minus 1 to 0 up to size of v minus 1. Okay. So that's, that's, that's my uh, family. In other words, when I want to actually draw a hash function from that family, my job is I need to construct a great big, I need to pick at random a great big map from all possible values in the universe, uh, from all values in the universe to all possible places they could go in the, in all possible buckets they could go in, in the hash table. Um, that's a lot of work, at least. Maybe also a lot of space, because after all, how would I, there's work involved in generating the hash function, but then there's also space involved in storing the hash function. You know, if our hash function really is going to be a table that we make afresh every time we draw from the, from the universal family, then we've got to store that table somehow. And that table literally has one entry for every item in the universe. And in the entry, we have to store an offset into the hash table. We have to store, you know, log of size of v bits, uh, size of u times. So that would not seem to be a practical approach at all. It's a very simple idea, and it's easy to see how the randomness gives us the property we want, because after all, all possible assignments of hash of keys to hash buckets are equally probable. So we can just think in terms of like the naive law of probability uh, and see that this is going to accomplish that goal of upper bounding a collision by 1 over n. You know, it's easy to see with naive definition of probability and symmetry and things like that. However, this is not an actual practical hash family. It's hard to draw uh, hash functions from this family. It's going to involve a lot of work. We have to generate lots of random numbers. And then to actually store the hash function so that we can execute it efficiently on data, we would need to construct an enormous uh, lookup table. All right, so the next question we would like to answer, which will be answered in the next video, is what's another family? Can we come up with a simpler family where we still get the property of universality, but it's easy to draw hash functions from the family? And then once you've drawn the hash function, it's easy to apply that hash function to lots of data. It's not taking a lot of time, and it's not taking a lot of space. We'll see that next.